And welcome again to Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Boucher, and this is On the Issues, our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today we are talking with the head of the history department in MIT, a professor of history, and the author of this new book. It's called Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities. Won't you please welcome Professor Craig Stephen Wilder to Marquette University Law School. Thanks very much for uh, visiting Milwaukee. It's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Well, let's talk a little bit about how this book came to be. Uh, you were saying to me earlier that this started as a smaller, different project. A, a, a tiny little project. It, um, I had taken a job at Dartmouth College. I was leaving Williams College in western Massachusetts for Dartmouth. I didn't want to lose a year in the move, and so I decided to write a short essay just <laughs> explaining how black abolitionists, the free black people, free African Americans, in the decades before the Civil War, how they entered the professions given their exclusion from colleges and universities. So how do you become a doctor, a minister, a teacher in a nation where you can't attend college? Um, and a lot of them, um, particularly the New Yorkers, the Boston, uh, studied privately in New England at small schools and academies or privately with ministers in their offices and homes. But along the way, I actually became much more interested in a contrast um, between the Native American experience at college and the American experience. And to sum that up, um, in part because I was at Dartmouth, and it has you know, one of the best Native American studies programs in the nation, I realized I was teaching two different sets of facts in different classes, but they actually spoke to each other. Um, the first Native American student to graduate from an American college graduated 75 years before the first black student. The first attempt to build a college for Native Americans is 210 years before the first attempt to build a black college. And when you put the statistics, the first Native minister who's ordained is probably ordained a good 150 years before the first black minister. When you put those statistics, when you say them in that way, it sounds as if Native students are privileged. But in fact, actually, what it really speaks to is the extraordinarily dynamic role that colleges and universities played in the colonial world in crafting the perception of who was educable and who wasn't, um, who, was, uh, who could be saved and who could not. I, I want to uh, uh, talk about the conclusion you reached based on your research. And early in the book, I think it was page 11, you, you said this. You said, the academy never stood apart from American slavery. In fact, it stood beside church and state as the third pillar of a civilization built on bondage. That's a strong statement, and, and you've talked, I know, in other interviews about the importance of higher education, about the academy and your own life. Was it difficult uh, to write this unflattering, unsettling history? It was, yeah. At times I think it was. My, my view of colleges, yeah, I'm a first-generation college student um, from Brooklyn, New York, you know, a mother who raised her kids um, on welfare and struggled to finish high school herself and get a union job in New York City, which gave us a chance to actually think about college. Um, that was her great dream for us. You know, and I went to Fordham University um, in the Bronx, a uh, good Jesuit school, um, and, and then headed off to Columbia for graduate school. And so for me and my sisters, you know, colleges changed our lives. Um, colleges gave us a chance to fulfill my mother's dream of her kids becoming professionals. Um, and I've always seen colleges as, as benevolent institutions. I work at them because I think they have the extraordinary capacity for social good and for social justice when I was an undergraduate. Um, and so there were moments when the book was unsettling to me, but not because of um, what it said about colleges. I don't think, you know, ultimately the aim of the historian, the task of the historian, is to tell difficult truths as honestly as we can and to help the reader understand both the complexity and the disturbing realities of the past, that we can't escape that past. We can't run away from it. And so we might as well turn and confront it as honestly as we can. And I think universities are very good, um, scholars are very good, at exploring the role of slavery in American society in other institutions. You know, we've looked at Presbyterians in slavery. We've looked at Quakers in slavery. You know, we've looked at the merchant houses in slavery. We've looked at 
the, um, you know, everything from churches to the presidency and slavery. But we tend to shy away from looking at our own institutions um, and slavery. We've tended to sort of hold them separate. Um, I think that's unfair. But I also think it's a disservice to the public because there's a lot to the relationship between colleges, universities, slavery, and the slave trade. Um, in particular, what we can learn is the centrality of slavery to the rise of the British colonies in, the Nor in North America and ultimately to the United States. Let's, let's tell this story then. Let, let's go back. Ed, you made an interesting comment here as we began about and their experience in higher education in this country. Um, because, was it not, um, the people who were living in the colonies at the time wanted to civilize Native Americans. Was that the rationale? That, that's part of the rationale, absolutely. You know, one of the reasons for building colleges in the early colonies, and I point out in the book that within a decade of their arrival in Virginia and Massachusetts, the English colonists are attempting to build colleges, you know, which is a strange act. You know, these are two regions where um, they can barely themselves, where they're actually having problems laying out farms an operative uh, economy. Um, but they actually start investing in and planning for colleges. And so I was kind of struck by that. I wanted to, you know, as historians do, I wanted to know why. Um, and part of the role of the college was to evangelize the quote-unquote savages, um, the native people Christianity and spread Christianity within that world. That aim also had strategic benefits. Um, it Civilize, meaning um, bring native people and native nations under the dominion of the Christians. Um, and, you know, and there are all sorts of consequences to that that we can talk about. But in, in trying to figure out what I ended up doing was turning to Scotland and Ireland. Um, in particular, I, I went to Scotland in particular and spent quite a bit of time there studying the sort of early history of their universities because one of the things I wanted to look at was what were universities doing in Britain before American colonization, before the American colonies are established. And one of the roles that the universities played in the early modern period, um, the British crown, the English crown is actually um, funding and encouraging the establishment of universities in Scotland and Ireland, in part to root out the remnants of Catholicism, to extend English governance over these sort of wild colonies, um, the savages of um, Scotland and Ireland. Um, and to make military governance easier um, in these remote places. And the idea, therefore, of also deploying colleges in the Americas was quite sensible. Um, I, to put it differently, English universities and British universities had already been militarized in that way um, long before Virginia is established. It's a, it, so there were Indian colleges. I think yeah. you mentioned that at Harvard. Yeah. One of the first buildings on the Harvard one, campus one was... Of, the, the very first brick building and one of the early buildings is the Indian College um, at William and Mary, which is founded... And Harvard's founded in 1636. I believe the Indian College opens in 1655, um, somewhere around that time. The, um, at William and Mary, which is founded in 1693 in Williamsburg, Virginia, um, one of the early framing buildings of the campus. If you've been there, it's the Wren building, which is the sort of center of the campus, the president's house on one side. And mirroring the president's house is Bradford and Hall, the Indian College. Um, and so all of the early universities actually had active Native American mission as part of their overall um, purpose. There's an, another phenomenon begins, uh, well, it's not beginning, but it, it's, it's growing, the, the, the slave trade. Um, and it's interesting. I, I think uh, it shows that universities, even back then, were trying to raise money. They were looking at how do we grow this university, how do we grow this institution. And so the slave trade became an extremely lucrative way of raising money and finding students. Finding students, raising money, um, sustaining colleges. The, the uh, historian of higher, one historian of higher education put it very nicely that of the you know, hundreds of colleges that are established before the Civil War, the vast majority, probably about 80%, fail. And in the colonial period, the difference between success and failure is access to money and students. Um, the colleges are actually work on a really quite tight margin. Um, they need students, obviously, um, tuition-paying students. 
but they also need donors. Um, and in the early period, in the 17th century, for Harvard and William and Mary, there's an attempt to build a, a, a college in Virginia even before Harvard um, in the 16-teens and the early 1620s, which is the project is destroyed by an Indian war in Virginia, the Enrico College. Um, the, the attempts to sort of find cash lead the administrators, the governors of the colleges, to a new source of wealth in colonial North America, certainly by the end of the 17th century. The appeal is to turn to the rising merchant class of the northeastern colonies and to the planters of the West. There are two groups of people who are um, creating fant fantastic pools of So they begin to actually send um, and the way that you would do this is in New England at Harvard, for instance, you would um, reach out to the Puritan communions in other parts of the Americas, particularly within the West Indies. Um, in Virginia, they turn to England very often and look for donors among the wealthy absentee planters of the West Indies who live in places like London and Bristol. Um, by the 18th century, and this is where the slave trade reaches its peak in the second half of the 18th century, as the slave trade reaches its peak, there's something extraordinary that happens in North America. By 1701, there are only three colleges in the British colonies, in the North American mainland colonies. Harvard, William and Mary, and Yale, the, la the last of the first three, which is founded in 1701. Between 1746 and 1769, a 23-year period, six new colleges are founded. And all of them are founded in the active slave trading ports of the Northeast, or with close and intimate ties to the slave traders of the Northeastern colonies and the planters of the West Indies. Um, and that begins with Princeton in 1746, and it ends with Dartmouth in um, 1769. Um, and those ties are really quite crucial. Uh, it's the presence of this new money among the slave traders that allows the different denominations to begin to believe that they can have their own universities. They can fund their own colleges, the Baptists in Rhode Island, Congregationalists at Dartmouth, the Anglicans at King's College, which is now Columbia, New York City, Presbyterians in New Jersey, all believe that they can sustain their colleges precisely because within their communions are this rising class of slave trading families who have extraordinary wealth and extraordinary commercial ties to the West Indies and to Europe. It was very competitive, wasn't it? I mean, the, the, the competition for the, the sons and the dollars from the West Indies was yeah. enormous. Yeah, you know, John Witherspoon, a Scottish minister who comes to North America in 17... Signer of the Declaration yeah. of Independence. Uh, yeah. Future signer of the Declaration of Independence and a major advocate of the Revolutionary War. Um, Witherspoon comes from Scotland in 1768 to take over the struggling College of New Jersey, which had gone through a series of sort of tumultuous losses of presidents and other problems. Um, now Princeton, and um, Witherspoon immediately actually writes a missive to the West Indies in which he you know, declares to the West Indian planters that the very name of a West Indian has come to imply great wealth, both as flattery and as a warning that if they send their sons to England to be educated, men of ill repute, of low morals, will prey upon them because West Indians are known to be wealthy um, but if they, he's, if they send them to Princeton, they'll be properly taken care of and guided into manhood. They'll be far, far enough away from the um, West Indian colonies that they can't run home and be useless. Um, but they'll be close enough where the parents can visit. Um, it sounds, in fact, extraordinary yeah, it sounds good, extraordinarily extraordinarily you know. modern. Yeah. Um, but Witherspoon isn't alone. You know, the trustees of Columbia send constant missions. Um, em emissaries out to the West Indies and to England in search of money. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, then the College of Philadelphia, and at Brown, you know, Brown sends emissaries, ambassadors down to South Carolina to rake the Baptist communions down there for cash and donors and students. They send off to the West Indies. They send back to England. Many of them are actually often also claiming to evangelize Native Americans, um, which is a great marketing campaign, particularly in Europe. Uh, because there's a fascination with native people, um, which the colleges become very skillful at exploiting, um, even though they actually have very few, if any, native students on campus. 
um, the claim to actually educate Indians um, uh, continues for a long time. So we see the, the slave trade, uh, the merchants, as you refer uh, to them, uh, we see them funding these, these institutions. And we see the leadership of those institutions, they themselves are slave owners. Dartmouth, Princeton. And, and you, you end up with, you know, Brown University, when it did the 2006 report on Brown and slavery, um, Brown's relationship to slavery and the slave trade pointed out that the early college of Rhode Island had more slave traders on its board of trustees than any other colonial college. Um, it's probably also true that Columbia, um, then King's College, had more sons of slave traders um, in its early classes than any other colonial college. Um, but the other thing that students, even if they had no relationship to the slave trade at all, personally, would have encountered on campus was enslaved people. And so, you know, in the early so? in, in, what ways? in the early 1770s, you know, George Washington heads north from Virginia with his stepson, Jackie Custis, to enroll him at King's College, now Columbia. Um, he had made the choice, actually, I should point out, to avoid William and Mary. Um, Jackie Custis was already a bit of a scoundrel. Um, he wasn't a bit of a scoundrel. He was actually a scoundrel. Um, and Washington recognized his, his bad habits, poor judgment, um, and had very little trust that his son was going to reform himself in any way. And so he wanted to keep him out of William and Mary because he thought William and Mary was dominated too much by the sons of wealthy planters. And it would only exacerbate his moral failures, you know, his horse racing, womenizing, gambling, and all sorts of other things. Um, he takes him north to Columbia, but the other person that arrives with Washington and Custis is Jackie Custis's slave. And the president of uh, King's College, now Columbia, uh, the Reverend Miles Cooper, outfits Jackie with a suite of rooms that he then has papered and prepared for him. The slave Joe is actually given one of the windowless rooms in that suite. Um, if you think about the colonial campus, um, at William and Mary, about 10% of the students right into the 1760s chose to bring their slaves with them to campus. But even was if they did... Was that typical for someone who was considered prosperous to own a slave at the time? Owning slaves, yeah. You know, the, one of the ways that the uh, early biographers of the graduate and Yale, for instance, explain the frequency of slaveholding among the early graduates is they point out that, in fact, it was a habit of prosperous men to own enslaved people at the time. And, and with that rene moral renovation, they then move away from the problem. Although they actually use slaveholding very often as a measure of wealth, as a way of figuring out what someone was worth at the end of their life in these short biographies of the graduates. Um, and so it is a relatively common thing. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, in the college towns, slavery was, in fact, a vibrant economic institution. About probably one out of every six people in Princeton, New Jersey, is enslaved by the second half of the um, um, 18th century. The, the numbers you point out about the number of slaves who were in the colonies was, was really yeah. quite interesting to me. It's, it's I think, probably far greater than most people in this yeah. room would yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it's probably about one out of every six in Princeton, New Jersey, about the same number in Manhattan when King's College is founded. Um, there are enslaved people and free black people who work on the campuses. Um, there are enslaved people in the president's houses. There are enslaved people in the houses of the trustees. You know, at Princeton, the first eight presidents of the College of New Jersey are slave owners. Um, at Brown, you know, uh, then the College of Rhode Island, with his slave to town to take over the college. Um, and the, um, you know, at Columbia, um, both ventured servants um, and enslaved people appear in some of the early records of the college. Um, at the College of Philadelphia, now the University of Pennsylvania, um, enslaved people. Benjamin Franklin is a lifelong slave owner, the founder of the College of Philadelphia. Um, and, and one of its early presidents is a you know, and so I think the experience of the campus in the colonial world is an experience in which students were constantly in intimate relationships with enslaved people. And slavery became part of the, the sort of shaped the undergraduate experience of the American Academy in the colonial world. And slaves, in fact, built 
some of these institutions. University of Virginia was yeah. one that you mentioned in the book. Yeah, the University of Virginia is probably one of the you know best studied examples uh, because George Washington's um, is crafted with the hands of enslaved people um, who were leased and um, purchased for that project um, at the College of William and Mary. You know, in a single year, the trustees bought 17 people um, to work the campus. Um, Bradford and Hall, the old Indian college, had its own assignment of slaves by the early 18th century. Um, yeah. yeah, you mentioned that, uh, um, uh, you know, perhaps uh, our inclination is to want to think of universities in a benevolent way. And, and did, the, did the people who ran universities in those days, um, who owned slaves, think of themselves as being benevolent, that they were providing a, a form of humane servitude, that it really was, you know, that they were good to the people who worked for them. Let me, let me add one thing. I yeah. think that I, I don't want to leave it as a southern institution in which yeah. slaves built campuses. So let me just point out, you know, at Brown, you know, the, the local residents of Providence actually donate to the building of the college, and they donate, every, donate everything from lim, lumber mm -hmm. and other tools, but they also donate the labor of slaves um, to help raise the college. Uh, Eliezer Wheelock, the founder of Dartmouth, arrives in New Hampshire after he gets his charter with eight enslaved black people, um, including a baby. Um, and I write in the book that if you do an honest accounting of that, that means that Wheelock actually has more slaves than faculty He's got probably more slaves than students, trustees, certainly active trustees. Um, enslaved people are, in fact, the most prominent presence on the campus. Um, and he writes in his narrative of the school, which he uses as a fundraising tool, he writes a narrative of the, his um, Indian Academy and the project of the college, which he uses as a fundraising tool in Europe. Um, he writes repeatedly that he has his slaves building the different buildings of the early. I just wanted to you know, say you know, this is a northern and southern phenomenon. And in fact, actually, one of the things I point out in the book is the, the expansion of the Southern Academy is largely a product of the expansion of northern schools southward. Mm. I want to talk, uh, you mentioned uh, Benjamin Franklin. And in, in the late 1700s, you see this move to, I think his words were, to whiten America. So now it's becoming. Um, sort of the accepted uh, uh, thought of the day that that the nation would be better if it were whiter, if there were fewer Native Americans, if there were fewer uh, Africans, whether they be free or slaves. Um, that really uh, it takes us into a whole other episode and, and uh, racial science in this country and the role of universities in promoting a certain type of racial thinking. Yeah. Not a lot has been written and said about that. That obviously was something that was of great interest to you. It, it was, I, because I think it's one of the more difficult things for us to tackle, and it relates to the question I didn't answer of the right. benevolent posture of yeah. these um, presidents and faculties. And the, the answer is twofold. You know, the early leaders of American colleges did see the project of building colleges and expanding Christianity into the Americas as a benevolent project. Um, I think that historians um, and people interested can create a false choice between the um, project of expanding the faith and the military and strategic advantages of expanding the faith. Um, leaders, in fact, I would argue that most of them recognized that if they did the work of expanding the faith, there would and should be strategic and military advantages to it. Um, and they saw it as benevolent. The question is ultimately that they saw it as inevitable, the inevitable expansion of the faith um, and the inevitable punishment that would befall people who had. Um, the, what then happens is in the 18th century, in the middle of the 18th century, when we talk about that 25-year period in which colleges are expanding rapidly, one of the stunning realities that emerges within the intellectual culture of the United States at that moment, right, that six new colleges in 23 years, right, um, is that those new colleges actually have a very different relationship to the society than the older colleges did. 
they actually represent a fundamental transformation in, in the ways in which um, the people of North America, the colonists, begin to think about themselves and think about their relationships to other peoples. Or in other words, um, by the time Princeton is established in 1746, um, followed by the other five, Americans are increasingly coming to view the evidence of the past 150 years, um, that, that long history on the North American continent, as an evidence of God's sort of divine will for their expansion and their growth, and also the evidence of um, God's plan for non-European, non-Christian people. The devastation of Native American populations over that period of more than a century um, gets transformed into a lesson for the North Americans. Um, Benjamin Franklin will write it. Um, El, um, Ezra Stiles, who becomes the president of Yale um, and takes Yale through the Revolutionary War period, will write something very similar, in fact, almost um, quite parallel. Um, and what they'll begin writing is that the decline of Native American populations actually represents, in fact, part of God's divine plan a reduction and a removal of the native population and an expansion of the white population. Reverend Stiles of Yale actually goes on to predict that, that in little time there will be 300 million whites and a, continue, a continued decline of the Native American population. He also predicts that there will be a continued decline of the African population. Or the way that he starts to struggle with the question, and, I, and you know, I, I, Stiles is a complicated man. The way he starts to struggle with the question, the morality of Native American conquest and African slavery, is by reading the history of the past century and a half as a history of the declining presence of non-white people, which would ultimately erase the problem the moral problem of how they declined and when they began to decline. Um, Stiles, simultaneously, you know, he's a slave owner. Um, he purchases a young boy who he names Newport in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, he holds him as a slave. He, but the legend has it that he once, this is before he's president of Yale, he walks into the kitchen of his house and he sees the young boy crying at the table. And at that moment, what he had done, that he had stripped this child from his family um, and transformed him irreparable, right, that he couldn't repair. Um, and what Stiles ends up doing is he decides to give him a Christian education. And on the day before that Stiles becomes the president of Yale and moves to New Haven, he sets Newport free. Um, Stiles at Yale in New Haven establishes one of the early anti-slavery societies in Connecticut, um, he's the president of that society while he's the president of Yale, and many Yale faculty are involved in this society. And so Stiles is a complicated figure um, who still comes to believe by the end of the 18th century that the overwhelming evidence of history suggests that the Native American population here, but in fact actually that all of the non-white populations of North America will begin to disappear. And what this is really about is the growing tension between and interaction between theology and science. A growing understanding, popular understanding, that human beings actually fit into discrete racial categories and that the racial, the racial essence of populations of people fate in the world. Or in other words, the 150 years of devastation that Native American nations suffer become and get naturalized, and they become a consequence of something about Native people themselves, which allows Thomas Jefferson to be extraordinarily um, effusive in his praise of Native people, while simultaneously predicting that they'll disappear. Um, in the book, I describe it as, you know, these are not, although these are extraordinarily complementary terms at times and glowing um, descriptions of the oratory, culture, intellect, and bravery of Native Americans. These are not friends, these are eulogists. Um, this is an 18th century that's informed by a rising racial um, description 
of, a, of colonial society. And what I try to do in the book is show that, that the origins of that racial, those racial notions are in the nasty, bloody, violent business of conquest and slavery. They happen on the ground. The academy's role is that by the second half of the 18th century, as we're building all those new schools, both in Europe and in North America, colleges and universities begin to refine these popular ideas and to give them intellectual and scientific legitimacy. I, there are parts in this book, if, if you have a chance to read the book, um, that are absolutely, I, I used the word ghoulish when we were talking earlier, and, uh, but it was, it was in fact ghoulish in how some in medical science set out to prove races. What happened in that era? I mean, they, body snatching, grave robbing? Uh, it, it's pretty remarkable stuff. In the 18th century, when you, you know, let's, let's think about just for a moment the first medical colleges in the North American colonies. You know, I, I wanted to trace where these ideas were going, and one of the things I wanted to figure out was whether or not race was coming from science. Um, and what I end up arguing in the book is that race doesn't actually come from science. It, it actually comes to science. Um, and the carriers of these ideas are actually very often um, North American students. You know, it's the graduates of the College of New Jersey and the College of Philadelphia who head off to Europe for their science training and their medical training um, and who are writing dissertations on things like the course of disease among um, Negroes and Indians in the colonies, um, the presence or absence of albinism among Native Americans, the um, what we would call vitiligo, the expression of vitiligo among um, discrete groups of African Americans. One Virginian actually um, gives a full lecture in um, England on, um, on this very condition. Um, the son of a rather large plantation owner um, delivers this lecture. And one of the things I was interested in is if you follow these students across the Atlantic in the 1750s and 1760s, one of the things that you see is they of the Atlantic often as experts on race. They have extraordinary intimate relationships to Native Americans and Africans. You know, when Thomas Jefferson is at the um, College of William and Mary, about 10% of the student body is still Native Americans in the early 1760s. Um, Jefferson's father has a small plantation that's right on the sort of um, commercial route that Native people use to do, um, to do business with the Virginians. And so he grows up in a world filled with both Native Americans and African people. Um, these students in, the, in Europe um, emerge as experts, they give lectures, they actually write dissertations on race. Um, and so the construction of race science, the construction of academic racism, is a project that requires colonial Americans. Um, colonial Americans are critical to the evolution and the expression of race as we know it in the modern sense. And so in the 18th century, what then happens? These young men come back to North America and um, they begin to establish the first medical schools in the colonies. The first one is at the College of Philadelphia, now the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the ways that they actually, you know, there, there are hurdles that you have to get past. You have to get a, enough people to have a faculty. Um, by the early 1760s in Scotland, where many of them are studying, there are enough American students to certainly begin imagining that in the Americas you could establish your own medical schools. Um, by the 1760s, the young men in that program are actually planning that. They come back, um, they have a large enough body of professors of the various arts of medicine, um, but they need bodies. And so one of the first corpses that they get is the body of a Negro who's turned over by the um, government to the new medical program and allows them to begin public dissection. Advertisements in newspapers for training in anatomy and dissection often include details about the person, the anatomist, um, having been given the body of a Negro, a black person. Um, the, at the second of the colonial colleges, the uh, medical school that's now at Columbia, um, then King's College, um, it's access to corpses that allow you to really establish the program and keep it maintained, which means, in fact, that the students are often preying upon the African burial ground. 
that's where then the Negroes burial ground, the place where enslaved people are buried, to a point where you know there's quite a bit of um, tension, frustration, anger, and resentment in New York about the ways in which the enslaved, the poor, the marginalized get preyed upon after death. Um, the, the use of people in that way um, becomes so well known that actually, for instance, that the, there are complaints about one of the earliest, the earliest black church in New York, um, that they're holding the bodies inside the church in order to protect them from grave robbers. Um, and, and who is it that we're using? Who is it that we're volunteering for early science? It's enslaved people, Native Americans, and the marginal part of the European population, um, particularly the Irish. Um, certainly by the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century. Uh, yeah. I want to take a, a few questions from the audience, but I want to uh, bring our part of the conversation to an end by talking about the, the abolitionist movement. Academia, uh, or what academia thought of that? And, and it's, it's sort of interesting. Academia's response to that was to come up with a compromise. What was the compromise? You know, the academy, and I, you know, I try to be as honest as I can in the book about this, the academy has a, you know, a conflicted role in abolitionism because it is the site of many of the moralistic and evangelical Christian movements that lead to the wholehearted critique of slavery and that introduce of the morality of slavery um, to popular politics. And so part of the problem for the academy is actually that the academy has actually introduced many of the ideas upon which abolitionism will feed. But by the 1820s and the 1830s, the role of the academy begins to shift and shift dramatically. And it's not peculiar that it's at that moment, because this is when racial science is really crystallizing, but also when racial science begins to give the academy access to a new source of both funding and public influence. It's precisely the academy's claim to expertise over race um, that allows the academy to ultimately break free of the, its origins as, um, as a subsidiary, an arm of the church. And the final vestiges of sort of church influence over colleges are largely lost in the early 19th century. Um, the academy can make, academics can make, a secular argument about the, uh, and, a, and craft a secular vision for the future of the United States by the 1820s, which rests upon these earlier moral movements to abolish slavery. And one of, one of the early movements to abolish slavery, I should point out, is um, colonizationism. Um, you know, Ezra Stiles of Yale had actually personally invested in and attempted these projects himself um, of taking enslaved Africans, um, freeing them, and giving them enough education that they could then be returned, quote unquote, to Africa as missionaries. Um, and many um, early critics of slavery, this as a way of redeeming the United States, right? A slow transformation of enslaved people back into free people um, and ultimately into missionaries. And this idea that they could be removed to a place outside the United States where they would be free of the um, racism and animosity directed at that class. By the 1820s and the 1830s, the colonizationist movement largely um, shifts and shifts dramatically toward a much more anti-black position, that the presence of black people in the United States was an unacceptable phenomenon. The, accept the presence of free black people in the northern states was undesirable and unacceptable. And colonization was a way of actually uprooting these people and getting rid of them. But it was also a way of solving, at least reducing the tension between the free states and the slave states, because the common denominator between them would then be their anti-black positions. And while Virginia and the Carolinas and Georgia might want to keep or wanted to keep its enslaved population, its black population, as a labor force, um, the anti-black politics of that moment would also empower Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey to rid themselves of their black populations. Um, and it's not um, peculiar, therefore, that academics become overrepresented. The colonization movement 
at the very moment when it becomes most anti-black and most aggressively racist in its argument, and in fact at the moment when it becomes um, a real incubator of anti-black violence in the northeastern United States. And this includes, you know, the destruction of schools, physical assaults upon black students, um, largely driven by a fear that the education of free black people would allow them and empower them um, to make claims upon the United States that would keep them from being removed. Um, and so we destroy the first, uh, the attempt to build the first black college in New Haven, Connecticut, um, which is an attempt that William Lloyd Garrison and other abolitionists, black and white, are involved in in 1831. That project actually comes to an end. Um, and I argue that it's, it's not in this book, it's in a separate project. Um, I argue that in fact the, it comes to an end because of conspiracy of Yale graduates and colonizationists to stop that black academy from opening. The Yale graduates were also colonizationists, so it's the, it's the same group in both ways. Yeah. Very briefly, what has been the reaction uh, from some of these institutions uh, um, you know, to, to, to your work? You I, know, I, there, there's a part of the reaction that I'm kind of saddened by, a part of the reaction in the last, or uh, something that's happened in the past 10 years that I'm a little saddened by. In 2006, when Brown, on Brown and slavery, um, President Ruth Simmons of Brown you know, in 2000 report was extraordinarily courageous in taking this step. And in 2006, when the report was released, I think I was probably one of the downloaded it immediately. It was available electronically. I read the whole thing, and I thought, okay, well, this project's over for me. You know, the, um, every, all of Brown's um, peer institutions will do the same thing in the next few years, and none of them did. Not one. And I think that, to me, is stunning. And so the reaction to the book has actually been quite warm. Um, the reaction to the book has been quite receptive. It's actually been quite good on those campuses. I've talked at a lot of those campuses. I've been invited to talk at a lot of those campuses. Um, but what stuns me is the reluctance of many of our revered institutions to take up the moral to explore their own past and explore the difficult truths of their own past. Let me take a few questions from the audience in our remaining time. Please hold up your hand and wait for a microphone. I'll, we'll start right here, yes. And keep the questions brief, if you would, sure. please. I'll, sure, I'll do Thank this you. quickly. Given your historical analysis and interpretation of the relationship between blacks and the early Eastern colleges and universities, what are your thoughts or perspectives on the impetus or the context for this expansive recruitment and opening of doors in the mid-60s uh, for, um, you know, to bring in black students in particular um, to these same elite colleges and universities? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a, there are multiple answers to that. The, the most direct one is I, I think that colleges and universities are capable of extraordinary good, but we have to put them to that task. Colleges and universities do what we direct them to do. Um, my fear today is that we direct them to do things that are foolish, wasteful, um, and, so, and often socially irresponsible. Um, that the moral purpose of the college um, has eroded significantly um, in the past few decades. And so it, the, the project of actually um, opening the nation's most privileged institutions to increasingly diverse populations of of students um, and large populations of students who've been ex historically excluded from higher education, I think is a noble project. Um, but we've slipped, and we've slipped significantly from that. Um, and unfortunately, it often reminds me of something that happened at Columbia with its first president at King's College, Samuel Johnson, the founding president of Columbia, who basically gets dismissed by the trustees. Um, several years after the school is founded, and Johnson is a heavy critic of the trustees. You know, he, 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 in fact, actually in a note to his son, so, you know, says the stupidity, and that's a quote, um, of the trustees is just basically driving him nuts. You know, they're wasteful. They have these sort of extravagant fundraising campaigns. Uh, they actually have these sort of grandiose ideas about building this sort of monumental campus, and all of his merchant trustees, building this sort of you know, monumental um, campus in the middle of New York, which will be a tribute to New York commerce. Um, they never actually raise the money that they promise. 
Um, they spend extraordinary amounts of time actually going out, finding money, um, and you know, very little time focused on anything academic. And the trustees get tired of his myopia and eventually dismiss him. And they take Miles Cooper, who I mentioned before, um, who earns the moniker Rambling Cooper for his willingness to go on fundraising trips or any other trip that the trustees send him on, um, and his sort of freedom from um, a sort of academic-centric view of the college. And so every time I read through that body of material and notes that I had taken, it always reminds me of the sort of modern struggles of colleges and universities. Let me take another question. Yes. Okay, albeit that slavery is over, do you think there's still fragments of this kind of activity going on in university and colleges now? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, um, I, I think yes. You know, that college and universities still have very complicated roles um, that need to be publicly discussed and debated um, and need to be exposed to democratic processes. And one of my concerns about the increasing privatization and corporatization of colleges and universities is that it takes the decision-making of, the, of these institutions out of the public light. Um, and I think that's dangerous. I know that Mike said to turn off your devices, but as you spoke, I couldn't help but to pull up my iPad and go through the websites as you was going through the facts. And I couldn't, and every, all the facts as I was checking them, they showed a lot of things in a different light from what you're expressing, and I'm pretty sure from what you articulate in your book. So my question is, can you provide us with a list of websites or resources to go sure. to that sure. can give a more accurate as you spoke at the beginning, um, you have to keep the integrity of, historians have to keep the integrity of telling about the past. Can you tell us yeah. some websites to go to? Yeah, in the past few years, actually, several universities have begun to for their relationship to slavery and the slave trade. Much of that has been driven by faculty and students on campus. Um, and so, for instance, um, Harvard has a website, Harvard and Slavery, which came out of Sven, Sven Beckert's course at Harvard. Um, in which the students actually did research projects over multiple years on Harvard's relationship to slavery and the slave trade. At William and Mary, um, there was an exhibit um, in the museum on William and Mary and slavery, which you can you can find on the on the college website. At the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, there's there's now a multi-year conference that has explored um, the relationship between slavery on campus. At Emory, at Alabama. Um, at Brown, obviously, um, this history is being explored. Martha Sandweiss at Princeton um, for the last two years, I believe, now has a course on Princeton and slavery. Um, and so, yeah, you actually can begin to find those. And let me say just to, about the, you know, that distinction of how we treat this history. One of the interesting um, facts that happened, one of the interesting events that happened in the past decade is in 2001, which was Yale's 300th anniversary. I don't know if you remember, there was a controversy over the publication of the online site Yale and Slavery, um, which is actually still up, and you can, you can find it right now on your electronic devices. Um, the, but the, what happened there is that Yale had for, you know, anniversaries are a ritual moment of history making. And so Yale had begun, and, and so what happened is, you know, Yale had begun to write Yale's history in anticipation of its 300th anniversary, and it actually emphasized quite a bit um, Yale's role in abolition, which is quite accurate. Um, but it really avoided the question of slavery in Yale. And so a group of graduate students and um, staff produced the website Yale and Slavery, which was seen by, I think, a lot of people at Yale as an attack on Yale. Um, but in fact, actually, that's the problem. Right. It's the attempt to avoid this history that constantly comes to haunt us because it doesn't go away. Um, it lives with us. It lives within these institutions. Um, and and my, my point in doing the book is that 
Just, you know, I, one person asked me what the smoking gun was for their school. You know, and I was never looking for one. You know, I don't think that there's nothing in the archives that's going to bring Yale down or bring down Princeton or bring down Brown or Dartmouth. What's in the archives is a better, truer, more accessible uh, story of how we came to be as a nation. And it's difficult, it's problematic, it's troubling. But let me say, you know, it's as problematic and it's as difficult for black people as it is for white people. It's as problematic for, um, you know, for all of us. We all struggle with it. And my job as a historian is really to sort of help us through that struggle, help us make sense of it. Let me take uh, maybe one more question. My question is in, in reference to W.E.B. Du Bois and Frederick Douglass. Now, Douglass did a lot with uh, information around slave trading, yeah. et cetera, with the companies, et cetera. But Du Bois was around when they started to help schools with African Americans, et cetera. But either one, did, did you run across any policies that they tried to get implemented? Policies that, well, you know, I'm, I'm finishing, the story that I'm finishing finishes basically at the Civil War. The, the final, you know, the conclusion is basically a pre-Civil War conclusion, and it just, what I try to point out in the conclusion is that even after slavery ends in the northern states, these institutions remain, maintain a close relationship of the South and the West Indies, right? And so from New England, which becomes, in fact, a new source of wealth for New England schools, you know, it's why we begin building engineering schools like MIT. Um, in order to create enough engineers to build cotton manufactories um, in these sort of small towns that get turned into large industrial towns in New England. Right? Um, and this is slave-grown cotton. Right? Um, and you know, we're building engineering schools in New York uh, in response to both the cotton and the sugar trades out of the South. And so I end the story largely in, this, in the um, 1860s. And so it's a little bit before they would. But Frederick Douglass in particular has a close relationship to this question of African-American education in the decades before the war. He's at the National Negro Conventions, and he's one of the early advocates for establishing a school for the higher education of black people. After this violent period of the early 1830s in which the first black college is destroyed in New Haven, remember Prudence Crandall, um, the white woman abolitionist, um, from Canterbury, Connecticut, is both physically attacked, her house is destroyed, and she's put on trial for educating black girls. Um, and then the um, Noyes Academy up in New Hampshire is attacked by a mob of 300 people in 1835 who dress the school building in rope to um, rotate teams of oxen and men who pull the school off its foundations and a half mile through town to destroy it, and then turn cannons and guns at the houses of every white family who housed black students. By the end of that period, the project of establishing the higher education of African Americans, a school for their higher education, largely falls to the National Negro Conventions. And it's a small group of advocates there who maintain that project into the 1850s are now the first historically black colleges are established. And Douglas is among one of those early advocates. Final question will have to be brief. Yes, but thank you. Thank you for shedding light on this difficult part of American history. Uh, surely in this institution, the support for slavery could not have happened without the consent of the faculty, the students. And it is hard to imagine that there wasn't any rabble rousers or people who, uh, you know, uh, raise their voices against it. Were those those people, and how did the school handle them? Yeah, there, there are a lot of them, and that's why I said, you know, the, the colleges have a conflicted role because they're actually involved in abolitionism and anti-slavery and the movement against the slave trade in the early period. And they're also, in fact, they also become the dominant intellectual um, source of intellectual defense for slavery in the decades before the Civil War. And so a quick example of this is at Amherst. You know, the faculty and the students divide over abolitionism. And a student abolitionist society, the faculty attempt to silence a student abolitionist society multiple times um, and do everything they can to stop it. Um, this happens at many schools. The students are actually forming anti-slavery societies and the administrations and faculties are attempting to shut them down because they don't want the bad press and the, bad poli the, the, the public reaction 
to that kind of anti-slavery radicalism. Um, in 1835, at the commencement at Amherst, a student from Tennessee pulls out a heavy club and begins bludgeoning a student from New Hampshire over his abolitionism. Um, there is a violent campaign on campus, a violent struggle on campus over the question of slavery. And what I argue in the book is that ultimately the pro-slavery, anti-black position wins. Um, but it wins precisely because of the success of race science and the academic investment um, in the slave trade. We're going to wrap things up there today. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you who joined us today for your time and your attention. And a special thanks to our guest today, the author of the book, Ebony and Ivy, Professor Craig Stephen Wilder. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much.